<laughs> Next up, we have Eric Istes. Can you hear me, Eric? Eric, are you there? Oh, no, we don't have Eric. <laughs> I've got lots of waves from the technical team. We'll try to get Eric up with us. Uh, so moving on to Jeff. Have we got Jeff with us? We do have Jeff. <laughs> Jeff Plate, wonderful. Uh, Watts, Griffiths, and McWitt Limited, is that correct? McEwitt. <laughs> McEwitt, thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to Space Resources Weeks, everyone. Uh, if I can get my slides up for the screen here, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, address a topic as a commercial operator. So as a partner at WGM, I'm involved in terrestrial mining, uh, as well I'm the CEO of Interstellar Mining, which is a, a lunar mining company. And what I want to do is take a look at uh, some of the commercial applicability of mining regulations that are used in space or, or used here on Earth and the applicability of, of how we can use those and craft those in a meaningful way for the future of how we're going to uh, deal with space. So I'll just try to click onto my next slide here. So I'm going to use the example of the um, cadaster system, which is used in Canada, more specifically the province of Ontario. Uh, if we can get the next slide moved over, because if I, I click there, it isn't working here. Thank you. Um, so in terrestrial mining, for those of you who are not familiar, a cadaster system is a system in which you actually uh, stake electronically your mining claims and administer uh, your ownership and the status of those mining claims um, within terrestrial surface rights. Uh, so in Canada, we do this with an electronic system that's open to the public. So you can, anybody can come in and view um, the ownership and status of any of the mining claim areas that exist and the nature of whether or not those mining claims have been converted to a mining lease or uh, an operating mine, for example. Uh, in order for you to actually get onto the system and actually stake things, you need to be a registered prospector. Um, so there is uh, some gatekeeping functions involved with it. A couple of the interesting key features of this is in order for you to keep your mining claim in good order, uh, you can't just sit on it. You need to work on it by doing qualified work. And that qualified work involves um, prospecting and geological mapping. It could be drilling, it could be assaying and sampling. Uh, geophysical surveys, uh, and in certain cases, uh, limited work engaged, for example, with uh, community and indigenous groups with it. Um, it has a couple of interesting features in that um, in order to keep those claims in good order, you need to file details of the scientific and engineering work you've done on the system uh, through uh, the program here. Uh, and so this is administered through an independent agency, so it isn't involved in political processes and, and any sort of manipulation in that way. It provides basic information for disclosure for everybody in the system. Uh, and more importantly, it also recognizes a very important commercial uh, element, which I will get to in a future slide, revolving to the blackout of certain sensitive data that's, that's time sensitive for commercial players. So next slide, please. So some of those commercial realities that I want to talk about is uh, what exists in terrestrial mining is, is oftentimes mining projects change hands fairly frequently. And so oftentimes data doesn't flow uh, a whole lot uh, or very easily within the, those various companies uh, and their, their information. So by having a repository of that scientific information, uh, it helps it to survive uh, future uh, transactions where it may be lost for some reason. Um, it provides a recognized framework for knowing who owns what and how to contact them in, in the event that you're looking for uh, to either acquire, to merge, uh, or to engage with uh, whoever uh, group that you need to engage with from a local community or indigenous groups to fulfill your obligations uh, as a mining company. Uh, and then it provides independent data for verification uh, and assessment for the operators involved with this. And this is all something that's valuable and important from a commercial perspective. Next slide. So there's actually a good commercial rationale for sharing geological data. 
So as I mentioned earlier, uh, oftentimes in the mining business, uh, companies uh, come and go, they go bankrupt. There's mergers, acquisitions, changes of control, and all of these things that can disrupt the handoff of data and other information from the various players. So there's a lot of benefits by warehousing a lot of the scientific uh, information that's been produced through commercial mining activities in a central database that's administered by a, uh, a governmental organization. Um, and in addition, uh, when you get a change of control in a particular project, it allows for that database to then be mined and then additional information to be passed on, which means you don't have to go back and expend the resources in effect doing the same work over again. Uh, and then finally, one of the great features of this as well is it allows for the reevaluation of future uh, in the future of past information, um, given technological breakthroughs, understandings of different deposit types, uh, which makes it a much more sensible uh, way of uh, engaging in this activity. Uh, next slide. So one of the things that I want to uh, comment on very importantly is something around commercial confidentiality. And this is one issue that I like to raise with respect to the Artemis Accords. Generally speaking, um, you know, on a commercial basis, a lot of the Artemis Accords make sense. But one area that is a bit of concern is as a commercial operator, is you're spending uh, blood and treasure going out and exploring for resources and then providing all of the information associated with uh, your, your, your science and exploration activities uh, can be problematic in effect that you're giving away all of the value that you've created for those who have, are your investors and shareholders. So one of the things by having commercial confidentiality in this is it reduces the risk from competing entities in effect freeloading and coming in and, and in effect stealing your work. Um, one of the things it also allows for is the ability to do thorough analytics and scientific information and analysis on the information that you've gathered uh, in dealing with these scarce resources. Uh, this could be a problem in terrestrial mining where you end up having an initial discovery and have a staking rush. Uh, and that could be uh, problematic and a waste of, of scarce resources when everybody tries to, uh, to get in on the action in a particular area. Finally, by providing that commercial confidentially over a period of time, it allows a company that may have uh, limited resources who have uh, taken the time, energy, and risk associated with discovering these resources to then go out and secure additional financings to actually act on uh, what they finally uh, uncovered uh, with it. And that's the commercial realities. Next slide. Which leads me to the idea that we need to really negotiate Outer Space Treaty version 2.0. And this is really a reflection of the need to address a lot of these commercial concerns because the original Outer Space Treaty when it was uh, envisioned and created really was a function of the time when uh, space was really the domain of all of the major powers um, and governments and really commercial operators didn't really exist in that and that needs to be reflected. Next slide. And these are the key points that I'd like to address on this, which is the value of these commercial rights and the very critical importance is to the investment community. As a terrestrial uh, op operator who, who deals with terrestrial mine finance and as a CEO of a space miner who is trying to raise capital, I can tell you that these are the things that matter very importantly to investors when they're dealing with um, things in space. So first of all, they want some uh, confidence that they own the legal rights, at least to the resources, and more importantly, what they're buying, whether or not it's a mining claim, an operation, a piece of technology, whatever it is that's incredibly important with it. Uh, in addition, um, although the current space uh, legal framework uh, allows for limited uh, regulation uh, of operations, because no one country can claim sovereignty, um, there is an idea from a commercial perspective that there needs to be enforceable contractual rights uh, and some process to adjudicate uh, commercial disputes in a way that's fair and reasonable so that there is some certainty for things. Uh, a basic example of that may be the uh, ownership of a particular, uh, let's say it's a ton of water or propellant on the lunar surface, is to know that uh, that uh, existing ton of water, that the ownership of it is noted and that 
you don't run into situations where that ton of water, for example, could be rehypothecated, in effect sold, to multiple parties when there's actually only one ton. This would uh, create an issue. And there's really functions around audit and control and how to handle all of that. Um, and then finally, there needs to be some sort of engagement with commercial operators in this particular sector so that the regulations make some sense uh, for the uh, players who are actively involved in this uh, and not seem to be done uh, remotely and by distant powers who do not understand the operating environment that you exist in. There is some terrestrial examples of that here in Canada, uh, specifically in the Yukon and the Klondike, which was a, a huge area for a lot of gold development about 120 years ago where you know, the miners there uh, got together and engaged in self-regulation uh, because it was largely absent. And when it did arrive, it was on the backs of a distant capital that didn't really understand the operating conditions that existed on the ground. And that resulted in a, a regulatory framework and a way of operating that uh, created a lot of harmony and it worked for the people involved. And so that would be my final suggestion is to ensure that at the heart of this is that the commercial operators are engaged and interested in it and do have um, very much an interest in sort of law, order, and good governance uh, around things because it's simply good business. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, close my comments and uh, move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much.